ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صفي من خلقه وحبيبه والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين محمد مصطفى وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين We've just heard the lecture on Salahuddin Ayyubi, brothers. <coughs> and 20 years before Salahuddin Ayyubi, he, 20 years before he recaptured Jerusalem from the hands of the Crusaders, a terrible man was born in Mongolia. His name was Genghis Khan. Okay? Genghis Khan, in 1167, he was born. And the Islamic State or the situation of the Muslims at that time was you know similar to what it is today really in terms of that Muslims were split up into many different states there was not one large Khilafah ruling the Muslim world so for example Iran and Khurasan was run by Muslims the Khawarizmi tribe Sindh, Pakistan and Afghanistan was run by Muslims called the Ghawriya Sham, i.e. Syria and Palestine was run by the Ayyubiyya. <coughs> Iraq was ruled by the Abbasi. And Turkmenistan and Georgia was ruled by Salajika. These were the main states that were around at the time. Also at this time, Bid'a had spread through extreme Sufi groups. It was very prevalent amongst the Muslims. The Mongols under Genghis Khan began their campaign of terror and by 1216 Genghis Khan had conquered Korea, Mongolia, China and Tibet and then he started to look towards the Muslim lands and by 1219 the Khawarizmi they were defeated Iran and Khorasan then 1231 to 1242, Afghanistan, Georgia, Armenia, all these states, they were annexed and taken over by the Mongol horde. And what would happen is every single person would be terrified. And all the Muslim states in this situation, they submitted themselves to the Mongols. They didn't put up any resistance or they didn't retaliate. Rather, they would invite them in and say, look, take over our country and don't cause a bloodshed. And so, jihad was non-existence in the mind of the Muslims of these states. Now, the Mongols, they became more and more brave until eventually they decided they were going to destroy the seat of the Islamic Khilafah, which was Baghdad. By the time the Mongols had reached Baghdad, the leader of the Mongols was a man called, in Arabic, he's known as Huluku, and in English they call him Hulagu. Okay, Hulagu was his name. <coughs> and he started to look towards Iraq. At the time Iraq and Baghdad, we said the Abbasids, they were in power. And really it was the end of the Abbasids, the end of their, of their reign. And a lot of bid'a and a lot of uh, 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 amusements and pleasures of the world is what the Abbasids were concentrating on music and dancing girls and, and uh, all these kind of things now the Khalif Musta'sim he was taking advice from a Rafidi from a Shi'i man called Ibn al-Alqami Ibn al-Alqami and Ibn al-Alqami he was in contact with Hulagu also he was a Shi'i, and that's some, you know, the people of Ahlul Sunnah should never t uh, trust Shi'i people. He was in contact with Hulagu at the same time as giving advice to Musta'sim the Khalif. And under his advice, the advice of uh, Ibn al-Alqami, when the letters of Hulagu reached Musta'sim saying, give up Baghdad, otherwise we're going to cause terror in Baghdad like we did to all the other Muslim lands, what did Ibn al-Alqami advise him? He said to Musta'sim, reduce your army. The opposite advice that he needed. And so Musta'sim, he listened to him. 
There was another a governor who was also in contact with Hulagu. His name was Badruddin, and he was the governor of Mosul, which is in Iraq. And Hulagu, he asked Badruddin to assist him with weapons. So he was getting letters from Hulagu saying, I want some weapons. And Musta'asim also sent a letter to Badruddin. You know what he asked for? He asked for dancing girls and singing girls. And so look at the difference. One is asking for weapons, the enemy of Islam, and the other is asking for dancing girls and singing girls. And Badr al-Din, he said, look at these two letters. Look at these two messengers. Today, cry for Islam and the people of Islam. Because this is what this man was about, this Khalif. Now Baghdad, it had a population, it was one of the shining examples of an Islamic city. It had a population of more than one million. But despite this, despite this, there was only 10,000 people left to guard Baghdad. The capacity of soldiers was much more, but the soldiers, many of the soldiers, they decided that they would stay in the masjids and they go in the, in, in the marketplaces and they stay there and do dhikr and they make dua to Allah, oh Allah save us from the, you know, from the Tartars, from Hulagu and his people, and they just started making dua and this is what they did. As some people call, you know, this false claim, the Jihad Al-Akbar, as they say. And this is what they were doing. The Mongols, and they surrounded the city. And the Arab horsemen, compared to these Mongols, the Mongols, they looked, you know, tattered and they looked ratty and a ragtag army. And the Arabs, they looked like mountains. They had their armor and they had their large horses and they had, you know, their fine robes. But, as one of the Muslim commanders, he said, they completely and utterly demolished us. When they tried to, you know, even hamper their progress into Baghdad, they couldn't. In front of these ragtag Mongol horde. And then this advisor, Ibn al-Alqami, this Rafi, the advisor, he said that to the Khalif, you should give up the city without any conditions. Just give up the city and surrender. So, Musta'asim, he agreed. And he gathered 700 of his notables and his, you know, his emirs and his princes and his scholars. He gathered 700 of these people to meet Hulagu. And Hulagu, what did he do? As soon as he saw them, he slaughtered all but 17 of them. They were all slaughtered. This was how he met them. And then Hulagu, he had a meeting with Musta'asim, you know, one by one, face to face. And Hulagu said to him, give me the treasures of Baghdad. All the treasures you have in your palace, give it to me. So then, then Musta'asim then gave Hulagu gold and precious items and jewels. He gave him a lot of treasures. And then Hulagu said to him, he said, you are the host and I am the guest. So I deserve more. And it was said that when Hulagu said this to him, Musta'asim was shivering and quaking in his knees. He was shivering when he said this. And so Musta'asim then ordered the vaults to be opened and he opened up huge treasures for Hulagu and he said, here are the treasures of Baghdad. But Hulagu was not satisfied. He goes, I do not want this. Because Hulagu knew, because Ibn al-Alqam al Rafid told him about the treasures of Baghdad. He said, I don't want this, I want more than this. So Musta'asim, he ordered the palace floor to be dug. And the palace floor was dug he says that inside, when he, they dug it, it was like the size of a large lake and it was full of blocks of gold bullion. Pure 100% gold was inside this, this lake that they had really, you know, lake of gold was inside the palace. And you know what Musta'asim, what Hulagu says? Hulagu then says to Musta'asim, this is all your gold, is it? He, he picks up a chunk of gold and he says to Musta'asim, now eat this, eat this chunk of gold. And of course he can't eat the gold. He goes, how can I eat it? He goes, if you're not going to eat it, then what else are you doing with your gold? Why didn't you spend this gold on your armies? Because at least you would have been able to defend Baghdad. So if you're not going to do anything with it, why don't you eat it? At least do something useful with this money. And so he humiliated the Khalif in this way. And then it was, was said that the Khalif, he was placed in a sack and then they wrapped him in like a rug and they trampled him to death. 
they trampled him to death. And after they trampled him to death, Baghdad witnessed its massacre. Baghdad witnessed its massacre. And the massacre was so much that the people of Baghdad thought that these people, they were the Ya'juj and Ma'juj that, you know, Allah has talked about in the Quran. And the Prophet they thought these people, the Mongols, they were the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The, the Mongols, whoever they could see, men, women, old people, farmers, children, they killed. They didn't spare any single Muslim. People to hide away from the Mongols, they hid in wells, they hid in sewers, they hid in toilets, they hid in graves, they ran up to the rooftops of their houses and the Mongols would run after them and then they would hack them down and their blood would drain from the drains of the houses. They killed them in the masjids and the famous story says that a Mongol woman would go to the masjid and find the Muslim there and she wants to chop his head off with an axe. Okay, she wants to chop his head off but she doesn't have her axe. And she says to the Muslim, wait there until I get my axe because I've forgotten my axe. Okay? And so against this female Mongol warrior, the Muslim would wait in the masjid waiting for him to be beheaded. That is a level of you know, uh, cowardice that had crept into the hearts of the Muslims. They burnt the books and they used those books and they, they burnt the books and they even used some of the books like Papi and Mashi to make structures out of, to make bridges, to make all these structures. That's how much, how much of, they said half the knowledge of the Islamic world had gone when Baghdad fell. Because that was the seat of the Islamic learning. And the rivers, they began to flow bl with <coughs> black, the ink of the books, after they had flown red with the ink of the blood of those people who had been massacred. And the only people that were spared were who? Were the Jews and the Christians. They were the only people that were spared. And in fact, in the books of history it said that 800,000 Muslims had been massacred. 800,000 Muslims had been massacred in Baghdad. And Hulagu himself, after the huge rotting smell, he left. Right, he couldn't stay there anymore because of the huge rotting there after 40 days. And then it said after 40 days, when amnesty was declared and Hulugu had left, people then came out of their graves and their hiding places. And when they would come out of their graves, the father, he wouldn't even say salam to his son because he didn't want people to know that he was a Muslim in case there was a Tatar somewhere lurking and he would kill him. That was the extent of the devastation. And so, in 40 days, 500 years of great Muslim civilization was destroyed at the hands of the Mongols. And when this happened, the Christians, they celebrated. They, because they were the, the, crusading, the crusades were still happening. And they were celebrating that, look, Baghdad has failed, and they were very joyous and happy. They were very joyous and happy. And this is, there's a hit lesson to be learned from this. Did they resist? They didn't resist. And humiliation fell upon these people. And if they were to read hadith of the Prophet wasallam, they would have known that this humiliation has been ordained for any group of people who accept their humiliation. Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he says in the hadith, in the Sahih hadith, إِذَا ضَمَّ النَّاسُ بِالْدِّنَارِ وَتَبَايَعُوا بِالْعِينَ وَتَتَبَّعُوا أَذْنَابَ الْبَقَرِ وَتَرَكُوا جِهَادًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ سَلَّطَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ ظُلًّا لَا يَرْفَعُهُ عَنْهُمْ إِلَّا وَأَنْ يَعُودَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِلَى دِينِهِمْ He said, if the people, they begin to hoard money and they become stingy with their money. And they begin to تَبَايَعُ بِالْعِينَ عِينَ is a type of contract in which interest is involved, but the way that interest is, it enters the contract is through like, you know, a, a loophole. And people utilize that to get some interest. If they do this in a contract, and they hold on to the tails of cows, meaning their only concern is agriculture and making money and getting food. And they leave jihad in the way of Allah, what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down upon them a humiliation. And He will not lift this humiliation until the Muslims, they return to their religion. So this humiliation afflicted Baghdad. It afflicted Baghdad. This was the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and the curse of all the people it says in another hadith for when the scholars they say this is not the time of jihad and afflicted Baghdad and so Hulagu after taking Baghdad was he satisfied? he wasn't satisfied he then began to take the other Muslim lands okay you know Palestine and Syria these areas they began to fall into the hands of the Mongol horde and in fact it said that many of the governors of these, these countries they invited them in after seeing what had happened to Baghdad it was a, it was a terrible shock to the Muslims 500 years of civilization finished the terror it spread into the Muslim hearts and a lot of the Muslims they fled they left their homes their positions and they ran westwards towards Egypt Egypt was the only place the only sanctuary where there was Muslims still left who were ruling by the Sharia all the other Muslim lands had fallen into the hands of the Mongols and so Egypt it became a refuge for the fleeing Muslims from the Tartars now at that time Egypt was run by a king who originally was not destined to be a king. In fact, they were slaves brought into Egypt. Okay, by the Ayyubis, they were slaves brought into Egypt. And these slaves, they originated from Chechnya and from the Caucasus mountain regions. But then they themselves took control and took power and they themselves became kings. And these were known as the Mamluks. In the Islamic history, if you ever hear of the Mamluks, these were these people. They were, in, they were controlling Egypt. And one of their leaders is a great man by the name of Muzaffar Qutuz. Muzaffar Qutuz, Saifuddin Qutuz was his name. Now, Qutuz, alhamdulillah, he was a brave and fearless soldier. He didn't know the meaning of fear. And his chief counselor, uh, Baybaz al Bandiqdari, he was even more, you know, fearless than Muzaffar Qutuz. And what had happened is that Muzaffar Qutuz, he began to train his soldiers. And he began to train the refugees that were coming and fleeing to Egypt all the way from from Syria and all the other Muslim lands. Now, the challenge to Egypt came earlier than expected. And again, Hulagu, he sent one of his terrible letters. You know, every Muslim leader would be terrified to receive a letter from Hulagu. And Muzaffar Qutuz, he received this letter from Hulagu and Hulagu demanded that Egypt surrender. Otherwise, the same thing that befell Baghdad would also befall Egypt. Muzaffar Qutuz then held a council and he decided that he will fight. He decided that he would, he was going to fight. Now, it's very important to know that who are the type of people that Muzaffar Qutuz surrounded himself with. Muzaffar Qutuz, he had love for the ulama and the ulama that, you know, were ulama of honor. And he surrounded himself with one of the greatest ulama in history. His name was Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam, Shafi'i ulama. You always hear Abdullah Azzam talking about him, al Izz ibn Abdul Salam. And al Izz ibn Abdul Salam, he was one man that didn't fear anybody. And before Muzaffar Qutuz came to power, one day there was a king in Egypt, and this king, his name was Ismail ibn Adil. He was the king of Egypt at that time. And he had sought help from the Crusaders against his own brother, because he was afraid about his brother, that his brother would compete against him. And so, <coughs> King Ismail, he then supported the Crusaders and he gave the Crusaders money and he even gave them fortress and he allowed them to come to Sham and buy weapons to be like a buffer against his brother to be a buffer against his brother because this man Ismail was scared that his brother would you know, compete with him in the kingship of Egypt so he helped the Crusaders and said if there's any problem for my brother then you come and come to my aid. And then this Sheikh Al Izz ibn Abdul Salam, he was at that time like responsible for the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Justice, he had all these powers. And he was the Imam of Al Jami Al Umawiyah. He was the Imam of that large masjid at that time. He then 
made a fatwa saying selling arms to the crusaders is haram and he didn't make any dua for the king at that time in the khutbah of Jumu'ah. And at that time, if no one made dua for the king, it was seen as if he is not giving the bay'ah and he's relinquished his bay'ah. And so, he was stripped of all his positions and he was expelled. Many scholars then came to Al-Izz ibn Abd salam and said to him, look, come back to your position, say sorry, you know, you know it's better that you come and be with the, in the government, you can change the government with inside, come and come back, please, we need you. Al-Izz ibn Abd salam he refused and he said, he said these, these words. قرأت العلم لأكون سفيرا بين الله وبين عباده. I read knowledge, I studied علم to become a diplomat between Allah and His servants. وأتردد على هؤلاء. And you expect me to go to these people and seek, you know, money and seek positions? The only reason I studied علم is to be a diplomat between Allah. And his servants. And then it was said to him, all you have to do is, look, is kiss his hand. Kiss the hand of the king and he'll let you go. And he said, Wallahi ma arda an yuqabbil yadi fadlan an uqabbil yadahu. Ya qawmi innani fi waad wa antum fi waad. Walhamdulillah afani mimma ibtalakum bih. He said, I am not happy that this king, right, kisses my hand and you expect me to go and kiss his hand I'm not happy that he comes and kisses my hand he goes my people you, I am in one valley and you are in another valley so I'm in one world, you, you are living a completely different life than me yeah and he said Alhamdulillah that Allah has saved me from this trial that he's you know, you know uh, um, charged you with and so this is the kind of alim that Mudhaffar Qutuz surrounded himself by Mudhafar Qutuz, he ordered that the tax be increased above zakat. Add tax because we need to make weapons, we need shields, we need you know, horses, we need to train people, we need to defend, we need money. And so he started to raise the tax. Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam said, O oh, Mudhafar Qutuz, I will not allow you to raise the taxes until you and all your people first give from all the gold and the treasures that lie in your vaults. And all the princes, first they must give that in the way of Allah. And then I will say to the people, and I'll, I'll agree in raising of the taxes. So you can see that the person that he surrounded himself with. And it's one of the faults today, that many of these leaders, they don't surround themselves with the pious and honorable ulama. <coughs> now, the Mongols, they had sent messengers to Mudhafar Qutuz. They sent messengers to Mudhafar Qutuz. And what Mudhafar Qutuz started to feel was that the Syrians that had fled and ran and all the other countries, the Khawarizmis and all the people that had fled, all the Muslim lands that come to Egypt, he was worried that these people, they will buckle. They will be scared, they will be cowards and they will not fight. They will not fight because they ran away. They didn't fight in the first place and they ran away. So, he tried to he thought, what should he do about this? How can he prevent them from deserting? And so, uh, it was suggested that all these soldiers, they will be killed. And so they were killed, and their heads were, hang, were, were stuck on poles on the streets of, 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 uh, of Egypt. Of Cairo, they were, they were put on poles and they hung. And then the Syrians knew that that's it. Now, for sure, the Tartars are going to come into Egypt. And we can run wherever we can run, we're never going to be able to run away from them. Even up to the Atlantic, they're going to come, so it's more, we might as well stand our ground and fight. There's nowhere else to run, because they know now, because of what Muzaffar Qutuz has done, that the Tartars are going to come. And uh, some, of the, some of the chiefs, some of the people that wanted to run, Muzaffar Qutuz go, go, run, take your money, leave. Some of the chiefs, some of the princes, he let them go. We don't want you. But we want people that are going to be brave and honorable in jihad. So, they moved on to the plain of jihad <coughs> and <coughs> firstly Mudhafar Qutuz went and then also Zahir Babers he led an army and he was the cavalry the Babers was the cavalry and Mudhafar Qutuz had the infantry, infantry with him and um, 
Then when they reach the borders of Egypt, when they're going to meet the Mongols, and if you look at your map, the Mongols, they were coming down from Lebanon. Okay, they're, they're taken over Baghdad and they're coming from the north direction from Lebanon down where now towards the Palestinians, where Philistines, where Jeru Jerusalem is. And so, Mudafar Qutus, he decided to meet them. So he was leaving Egypt, leaving Cairo and going to meet them and the actual battle, it was going to take place somewhere in Palestine. And when they reached the borders of Egypt, many of the Egyptians, they hesitated. They you know, fear overtook them. <coughs> and then Muzaffar Qutuz, he said he would fight the pagans single-handedly and on his own if necessary. And those who wanted to leave him, they are free to go. And then he marched with the Mongols, with the Mamluks. Not the local Egyptians, but the Mamluks that had come to Egypt. He marched forward and said, I'm going to leave you alone. Even if it's me on my own, I will fight these people. And then the rest of the Egyptians, they joined and they followed the example of their leader. Now, the Mongols, they were known for their quickness. They were known that they would, when the Mongols would take over any country, or they'd move across land, they'd move very rapidly. But Muzaffar Qutuz was also very fast, and the Mongols were also very fast. And the Mongols at that time, were, today is, you know, where Gaza, or Gaza is today, that's where they were. And what had happened is that that's a group of a garrison of the, of the Mongols was stationed. And Muzaffar Qutuz immediately sent the Zahir Babers on his cavalry to chase after them. And before they could even flee, they were mown down, that garrison of Mongols, by Zahir Babers. Now, <coughs> the Egyptian army and the Mamluks, they marched up and they reached an area called Ain Jalut, the Valley of Jalut, right, which is just near... Gaza is okay. Gaza is you know below Jerusalem, near where Gaza is, not too far away. And he marched, and on the side, on his side, there were twelve thousand soldiers. Okay, twelve thousand soldiers of the well-trained and disciplined soldiers of the Muslims. Now we need to talk a little bit about these two armies. The Mongols. They had a huge army and they were known for their rapidness and they were known, for example, the Mongols, their army was so huge that they couldn't move across a, a land in one line because there wasn't enough grass or fertile land for their, for their horses to take. So they had to search for fertile land and they would flank their enemy and they would surround their enemy and they'd move rapidly before the enemy even knew it, before the people of Baghdad knew it, they'd completely surround Baghdad. They moved like this, like lightning. Because in the steeps of Mongolia, from a very natural, you know, early age, they were known to be, you know, uh, they, were, they were used to riding the horse. They were used to, to the horses. And the type of horse that was bred there was, was a very fast type of horse. And what they would do, they'd surround the army, and then they were experts at using the longbow. And when they surrounded the army, they would fire from a distance at the army. And when the army would be disorientated and would be in complete and utter confusion, then they would march and strike at the army. Okay, so they'd confuse them first from far distance, and then they would strike. Similar tactics is used by the Americans today when they fire from you know high uh, high altitudes <coughs> and bomb from high altitudes. And it was very difficult to find an army of the Muslims that were like to, that could match the Mongols. And it's very difficult for the Muslims to train, in a few months' time, people to match these Mongols. But, from which area did the Mamluks come? They came from the Caucasus Mountains. Okay, they were the, you know, the original Chechen people. They came and they also had a similar training as the Mongols had had. And so here you had two mountain people meeting at the valley of Ain Jalut. <laughs> The two mountains, the two armies, they met at this uh, valley of Jalut. <coughs> and the Mongols, and alhamdulillah, this was the planning of Muzaffar Qutuz. It was a narrow valley. And the Mongols with the huge armies, okay, they had to fit into this narrow valley. This time, they were not capable of flanking the Muslims because on either side of this valley were the um, were marshes. 
called the Basin Marshes. And they couldn't go into these marshes with their, with their armies. And so they all had to cram into this narrow valley and they couldn't maneuver and they didn't have the, the liberty to, to maneuver. Muzaffar Qutuz, he organized his army. And if I have to hold up this paper, I will show you how he organized his army. If you imagine that this is the valley of, of, uh, <coughs> of Jalut here. On one side of Jalut, here was Mount Jilbawa and here was the river of Jalut. Muzaffar Qutuz here, okay, he placed the Syrian army and all, the, the, all those people that were refugees, he placed them at the front. I.e. the weakest troops, he placed them at the front, which was a very strange tactic. Then he had them flanked on either side with Mamluks, i.e. the fierce, the strong, the ones that were not f afraid and could stand and you know, withstand the enemy. And then also he had units of Mamluks behind the Syrians. And between each unit, as you can see, he left gaps. <coughs> he left gaps. And right here was the cavalry unit of, uh, of Babers. This was the cavalry unit. Now, <coughs> the Mongols, as was their custom, they began, like I said, they couldn't flank them. They began to fire longbows. And the Muslims, the, the, the Mamluks, they were not good with the longbow. They were good with the short bow. So their bows, the bows of the Syrians, could not meet and match the bows of the of the Mongolians, of the Mongols, of the Tartars. And so, the Tartars with the long bows, they kept on striking and striking until they disorganized and caused confusion amongst the ranks, the Syrians and the, the Khawarizmi and all those who were refugees. And as a result, panic struck these people. Remember we said that they were, they were, they were cowards, they ran away. And Muzaffar Qutuz knew this. Muzaffar Qutuz knew that when these people when the arrows would start to be, you know, shot at them, they would run away and they would not stand firm. And so these people, they began to run. And when the Mongols, they saw that a huge army of like Muslims, they're running away and they're fleeing, the Mongols, they led chase. They led chase and they went in. What had happened is through these gaps, the Syrians went through. The Syrians through the gaps that Muzaffar Qutuz had left of the, of the Mongol units behind, the Syrians could escape. And then when the Syrians escaped, because they were fleeing and the Tartars were going in them, they, they, the, the space of the Tartars was slowed down. And they didn't see and they didn't realize the cavalry on either side. And then suddenly the cavalry on either side closed in on them. And when the Syrians had left these gaps and retreated to, to behind the gaps, they were met with the Mongols, the, the, the Mamluks. With the Mamluk infantry they were met. And the Mamluk infantry was not like the Syrian infantry, it stood firm. And the Mongols were given a very, very nasty shock. When they saw these people, they were given a nasty shock. On either flank, they were surrounded, and then they met the Mamluks, and the Mamluks didn't retreat. And so, they closed them in. And when they closed them in with their short bows, they could, you know, they could attack them, and they hacked at them, and they mowed them down. They hacked at them, and they mowed them down. Uh, and then what happened? <coughs> then some of these Mongols, realizing they tried to escape, they tried to flee. From any direction that they could, they tried to flee. And as they were fleeing, they went up the marshes, they went up the mountains. Then this cavalry unit here, that's when it, it got ready. This cavalry unit then, they were the horses now. They led chase. Okay, Babers, he took his cavalry unit and as the Mongols, they're running in the marshes, they were running in villages, the cavalry unit took, took charge and it chased them. And it chased them through the marshes, they burned down them, they burned down the marshes, they marched them, they chased them in the villages. Any Mongol that they found, they, they slaughtered. And in fact, they chased them so much that for 300 miles the chase continued and they killed every single Mongol that they could find. And this was one of the longest pursuits in military history, right? For 300 miles, imagine Zahir Babers, he chases 
these Mongols across fields, across valleys, across rivers, across villages, until 300 miles he sees them and he wipes them out. And like this, like this, Muzaffar Qutuz, he got the victory in Ain Jalud, a battle which took place in Ramadan. Okay, the battle took place in Ramadan or on the 3rd of September 1260. The 3rd of September 1260, Baghdad fell in 1258, as I remember. And this was not only a victory against the Mongols, because the Mongols, when they'd gone into Syria, they'd also sided with the Crusaders. The Crusaders also sided with the Mongols, and they helped the Mongols. And so in Ain Jalut, the Mongols were destroyed, and the Crusaders was destroyed. So Ain Jalut... So Ain Jalut was a battle in which the terror of the Mongols and the terror of the Crusaders was finished in one go. And that's why, as Muslims, we need to remember this battle. And then Muzaffar Qutuz, he continued to take, you know, Palestine and Syria and, you know, establish Islam in those areas. Now, if the Mongols had penetrated into Egypt and they'd taken over Egypt and Muzaffar Qutuz and his people decided we're not going to fight, we'll do like all the other Muslim countries did, <coughs> there would be no Islam left. There would be no Islam left. Can you imagine all the way from like Tibet and Mongolia and Afghanistan and Khorasan and Iraq and Iran and you know all those countries and Palestine and Sham and Egypt and then they're taking all the countries all the way up to the Atlantic. What would have been left of Islam? Nothing would have been left of Islam. And because of these 12,000 people, only 12,000, all of Baghdad didn't want to fight. And all the other Muslim countries, they didn't want to fight. But these people, they knew the odds that were against them. They knew the odds that were against them. And they decided that they would fight only 12,000 against a horde numbering 200,000. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote victory for these band of people. أقولي قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك